Thank you everyone for joining me today. Um, I'm going to be talking about a, an enhanced workflow that we have in our genomic suite. Uh, the workflow will be some new exome data sets. It's going to be a cancer and control data set. And we'll kind of redirect and, and, and show a different way to use our software than we've had in the past, and then take advantage of some new functionality that enhances the analysis by importing database annotations. So I'd like to start, though, with, with an intro in a PowerPoint, and then we'll go into an assembly and some of the downstream analysis tools. And as Katie mentioned, um, you can chat in questions, and I'll address those uh, on the fly. So, so a little background with DNA Star. Uh, we, we have uh, three main areas of software and that are contained within our suite that include molecular biology and structural biology and genomics. And so it's really a comprehensive package uh, designed to cover as many of the different sequence analysis needs that, that you may have uh, you know, in your lab or in your company. And so we'll have webinars on specific topics. Uh, I, I typically focus on genomics webinars. Um, and, and the genomics uh, expert here at DNA Star. Um, so you can uh, again, you'll have my contact information at the end of the uh, end, end of the presentation, and you can also contact me directly with any any questions that you have. So our company was was uh, formed and founded by Dr. Fred Blattner and John Schrader out of the University of Wisconsin. Um, a lot of the software tools were originally designed to help. Uh, Fred sequenced the E. coli K12 genome, so this is back in the 1990s. So as the software was developed, it uh, quickly be became apparent that um, other people could uh, uh, benefit from the same software, and so it was commercialized. And at this point, we are in uh, academia and government, healthcare, commercial companies, uh, 65 countries worldwide. And so we have many individual users worldwide. We also have site licenses and organizational licenses um, you know, worldwide again. So depending on, on your situation, you may have access to one of these larger groups or, you know, or, or just your individual license. Uh, we have support as well that is uh, um, top notch. Uh, we have our office hours here in Madison, so you can generally get a hold of a live human being from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Central Time. Uh, we have chat, uh, we have direct phone calls, emails. Um, I also like to do webinars, so if it's a highly technical question that you have with a data set, we can do personal webinars and go through your workflow. And, and that's a great way to answer specific questions that we might not cover in a more general webinar like this. And of course, we have a global presence in nine different locations now as well. So we do a number of different things. Uh, you know, we, we, we lead the industry in sequence assembly and analysis software, and it's been all the way since the 1980s. And we really strive to develop software uh, that can support, uh, you know, Sanger and NGS sequencing in all the different platforms. And we try to provide as many solutions as is possible. You know, so you don't have to bounce between different software programs. You can get most of your work done right in the DNA Star software suite. And our, our focus has been desktop computing, although we have expanded. We have some softwares that take advantage of Linux clusters, uh, in particular our protein prediction and protein folding programs. And we also have some cloud offerings as well. So, you know, if you don't have hardware in place, you might be able to use the cloud. And I have a slide on that later. Um, we have over 52,000 publications. So we're the most published uh, sequence analysis software. So again, back to the 1980s, and you can see, you know, our next nearest competitor has less than half the publications that, that, that we do. So this really is software that is, that is, you know, created for scientists to do the research and, and to publish those results. So kind of a summary statement is that we provide all the software tools required for these three areas, molecular biology, genomics, and structural biology. So that's really what we're striving for. On the molecular biology tools, again, there's specific webinars here that can cover these topics. There's videos uh, on our website, but it includes things like multiple sequence alignments, um, annotation, sequence editing, um, all different ways to you know do these different multiple sequence alignments, do primer design, um, so it's, it's a really nice set of tools for kind of these basic needs in a lab. Structural biology, brand new software here where we can look at protein structures, secondary structure, and then fold those structures and look at, uh, this is a, a protein 3D, rotate the structure and find domains and regions of interest on those proteins. And there's ongoing work here and webinars coming up later this year that cover specific topics. And of course, genomics, where we're going to focus today. And in genomics, we're going to look at a, a kind of an, an overhauled sequence 
uh, the assembly software with a new interface, and then kind of a new workflow and some new analysis tools as well. So really some significant changes here. So our NGS tools are highly adaptable. Uh, that means we can, you know, scale up and do some very, very large projects. I did a webinar a couple weeks ago on de novo transcriptome, where we can now do hundreds of millions of reads assembled de novo on a desktop computer and, and really outperform softwares that run on gigantic Linux clusters and still take days and days to run. We're doing this in, you know, you know in, a, in relatively a short amount of time on a low-cost computer. Um, likewise, we can also do alignments to human genomes, things like exomes and RNA-seq and whole genome analysis, human genome or larger, um, again, on desktop computers. So we support all the different workflows and multiple different sequencing platforms. So that'll include, of course, Illumina and Ion Torrent and PacBio. We're looking forward uh, ahead to the future for things like Oxford Nanopore, um, so, so, you know, single sequencing or single molecule, molecule sequencing technologies. Uh, we're already working on uh, in those areas as well. So in terms of hardware, I'd just like to mention, you know, there's always a lot of questions on hardware. Um, certainly contact us if, if, you're, if you're thinking about purchasing the software and you have hardware questions. We can certainly help with those. Um, but our software is, has really, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's um, been designed so that it can run well on fairly basic computers. So for instance, I have a laptop that's got 16 gigs of RAM, not quite 32, and I plug in an external uh, four terabyte hard drive, and then I can store things on a, a second internal storage drive. That's sufficient for things up to like human exomes, so pretty big projects. The key here is that you have um, a four plus core computer with fast, uh, a fast processor. Um, and the RAM can vary depending on the size of your data. So if you have really big, deep data sets, more RAM might be beneficial, so up to 32 gigs of RAM. Um, and, but for, in many cases, 16 gigs of RAM is sufficient. And the key here is that there's three hard drives. There's a hard drive on the computer that runs the OS. I have a hard drive that handles uh, the, the, the scratch disk over here that handles the temporary files. And then I have a nice big storage drive to handle all the input and output files. So a three-drive configuration gives you the best performance for the big projects. Um, if you're working on smaller projects, things like microbes or viruses, you may only just need a, a single computer with one hard drive on it. Um, now, if you don't have this kind of hardware in place and you'd like to try the software out, um, a good solution is to use the cloud. And the way that it works is you set the assembly up locally, and what happens is the data gets encrypted and sent up to the Amazon cloud. And then the Amazon cloud then spools up uh, a computer for you, runs the assembly, uh, tells you when it's done, then you can just download it back to your computer. Um, so the cloud is, is, is really useful in, in, in certain situations. You know, one situation is when uh, you need to run 10 exomes, you know, and have them done by tomorrow, um, or, you know, high throughput. Uh, you can, uh, the Amazon cloud can, again, boot up multiple different virtual computers, so you can run multiple assemblies concurrently. And so there's an advantage there for throughput. And then the other advantage is that your data is then up on the Amazon cloud, so I, you can access it from multiple different points. So if you're traveling, if you have multiple different places where you need to access data, it's a great place to hold data and, 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 and store it. So today we're going to be focusing on variant calling. Um, and now we've had this kind of focus on accuracy now for a couple of years. And it really has improved to the point where our our accuracy defined as how well do we detect known SNPs in a sample, right? And, and in this case, it's a genome in a bottle uh, sample, which, which is uh, the, the genome in a bottle consortium, where there's a highly validated human genome where not all the genome, but a good portion of it, I want to say somewhere in the 80 to 90 percent of it, um, the SNPs are validated to a high degree of certainty. And so that, that genome can be used then by, uh, by DNA star to align data and then check to see if you find all the SNPs that you know are in that data. And so when that, when that genome was made available, it really allowed us to fine tune all the different steps from the assembly to the, um, the SNP calling to the SNP filtering. And you could evaluate each step in the process and improve at each one of those areas. And so we're at a point now where we're, we're comfortable with a 99.7 percent accuracy. Um, the answer isn't quite 100 percent, so, you know, the answer is probably 99.95, something like that. 
Um, and so as the answer improves, our software improves, we, you know, we're striving to get to 100% accuracy. And we have a number of different resources on our website. So if you have any questions at all about how we derive the accuracy, uh, it's, it's very well documented. We have white papers. We can make the data sets available. These are public data sets. We have built this workflow in our software. So you can run your own accuracy and not have to manually calculate all the things that are in this table, like true positive, false positive, false you know, FDR, false discovery rate, sensitivity. It, can all, it will all be done automatically in a validation report. And, and we'll have webinars that focus, and we have some on our website, specifically on this workflow. Um, so what I'm doing is showing you some of the results then from running, um, using that workflow that's in our software and running these data sets um, to a validated answer. And so, uh, again, this is a genome in a bottle, NA12878 genome. These are exomes, though, and these are exomes that are from three different sources, Garvan Institute, Arup Labs, and Mount Sinai. And so they were using different exome capture kits, so slightly different means of capturing, so it's a different process but it's fed into our software. And so the differences here really reflect more uh, the differences in the exome captures from the three different sources. And you can see that in all cases, the, um, the sensitivity um, is over 99%. It's as high as 99.92, as low as 99.6. We claim 99.7, something in the middle. Um, the false uh, discovery rates are below 3%. Um, the false negative rate is, is very low. You can see it's a, a very small, 45 false negatives, 27. This is out of a total of anywhere from 15,000 to 35,000 true positives. So when you add all, factor all those in, you get this high sensitivity um, uh, measurement. And the time for these exomes, uh, about two hours. The bigger exome from Mount Sinai, you know, closer to three hours. So we get a very, very fast assembly time and accuracy. And of course, we compared that to um, kind of the, the standard, um, which is the Illumina standard, which is the DWA aligner and the GATK SNP caller, two different versions of it, the unified and the haplotype based callers. Uh, and you can see kind of a, a similar theme throughout these comparisons. First of all, you know, both GATK and uh, DNA star uh, are accurate, and the Illumina data is very accurate. So, the, you know, the results in both cases are, are, are very close to 100%. You know, it's in that 99% range. Where we differ, though, is that DNA star software consistently gets lower false negatives. So if you're if you're um, looking for SNPs that are imp that are very important, you really want to have that false negative rate um, as low as is possible. And so our sensitivities were a little bit more sensitive. We have a lower false negative rate, um, about the same in FDR. And so we think that we outperform a little bit. We're about three times faster and we're a little bit more accurate. So it's a good place to be and a lot easier to use. And that's what I hope to show you in the webinar. So setting up BWA GATK is not trivial by any means. It can be extremely difficult and time consuming for most people. So again, this is kind of uh, documented in the white paper. We also compared against uh, the commercial competitor, CLC Bio. And here the differences are, are, are more marked. Um, CLC Bio, um, it has a more, there's definitely a lot more false negatives with CLC bio. So when we look at false negative detection rate, um, you know, we have 45, they have 222, and the false discovery rate is also much higher with CLC bio. So, um, and that leads to sensitivities of about a percentage point better with DNA star software, and we're about twice as fast. So for commercial competitors, we think we have them pretty soundly beat in terms of speed and accuracy. The best open source Illumina software you know, it's not quite as uh, market a, a difference, but we're still we still think we have a better a uh, better solution. So so again, those were benchmarks. Some of the new stuff that we've that we've added to this workflow um, are the annotations. So this is a human variant annotation database. So if you're working with human data sets, uh, we can bring in information um, from uh, our database, and it populates our analysis for SNPs. So we can have things like functional predictions and conservation scores and, and frequencies of alleles and import that into our analysis and then filter on it so that we can, again, find those interesting SNPs in these uh, very large data sets. And this is something that I'll, I'll be able to show you today. And so as we move to the live demo, um, again, we have all the different workflows. Uh, this will be a targeted resequencing workflow. And we'll start here in SeqMan Engine. So I'll just jump out of the PowerPoint. So 
Seekman Engine, uh, for those of you that have used the software before, you'll see that it looks quite different right now. So it's gotten a, an overhaul um, and, and it's been streamlined quite a bit. We've removed some of the things that uh, customers weren't using um, and, and put them back under the hood, under the script, and we've added some workflows like RNA-Seq are now all going to go through Seekman Engine. So we made things a little bit more streamlined. You can see that we have options to <coughs> excuse me, assemble on a local computer, assemble on the cloud, or rerun an assembly from a script. But we're just going to start on a local computer, and we pick our workflow. So we have an exome and gene panel. And you can see a variant calling accuracy test. So if I wanted to reproduce what was in the, uh, the previous slides, the, uh, the white paper results, that's its own workflow now. And I can you know, use my validated uh, DCF file, embed file, and my validated set, and get those numbers calculated for my sample. Or we just stick with our regular templated assembly. There's some system information that's gathered now. And so we, uh, the wizard, the Seekman Engine wizard checks your computer. Um, to see uh, you know, how much memory you have, uh, how much space you have for the temporary files. So two critical things. You want to have at least 16 gigs of RAM, and free space, you probably want a terabyte for most you know, larger assemblies. That's free space on that scratch disk. So it's nice to kind of uh, check that out for you. Um, template files. So what I'm going to align against, there's a new button here where I can download a genome template package. And this links up to the DNA Star website. And these template packages are the annotated chromosomes in GenBank format. And we also have the DB SNP database that contains all the validated known SNPs for those organisms, which get updated, you know, both the genomes and the DB SNPs on their own and different schedules. And so there's sometimes multiple different options. Uh, these are the most recent, this auto, um, um, automatic downloader will allow us to select some of the most recent options. Human, we have a few more options. A lot of folks are, are still using uh, 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 build 37 here and dbSNP 142. So I can select whichever one I want to use, and it will download that and load that into the project. Um, depending on my data set now, I may have a VCF files that contain in addition to dbSNP, it may be custom positions that I'm, or positions of interest, or maybe in, in the in DNA Star software, I've found SNPs of interest and I've created a VCF file out of them. And again, there's specific short technical videos that show you how to make a VCF file. So it's kind of its own its own uh, little topic. Um, and then I also have bed files. Bed files are the regions in the exome. Um, that have been targeted, or gene panel. So it's going to be the subset of the genome that's been sequenced. And the bed files are very important because they allow us to focus on particular regions of interest. And so we can use them to filter out noise that's occurring, say, or spurious sequence alignment that's occurring outside those intended areas. So again, very, very important to have a bed file. They typically come from the manufacturer um, wherever you did your targeted resequencing, they should have a better manifest file that defines those targeted areas. And again, we have technical videos that show you know, how to work with bed files, how to create them from scratch, and we can help customers um, get the bed file. In this case, it's an Agilent. This particular exome was from Agilent, and it's their all exon version 4 bed file. And so we'll load that in. And then we can pick our platform. Uh, when we select Illumina, it assumes it's paired end. If it happens to be single end, it, you know, we can uncheck this, uh, and then we can add data. So this is a this is a data set that I downloaded from the short read archive fairly recently, and it's a pancreatic cancer exome, and it has uh, both normal and tumor samples. And so I can load the FASTQ files in, and now I can group these uh, several different ways. I can auto auto name, or first I have to tell it it's multiple sample. And so what's going to happen then is I have to tell the assembler what the samples are, and it will keep them separate and build a separate assembly package for each one. And then we can, we can analyze them. So I can select and group and assign a name then for the group. So I'm just going to do that. Right, and I could have any number of, of samples here. These will be run um, in a series. So after, the, in this case, the normal is done, then the cancer will start. And it's about two hours per exome. 
Um, and so it'll run in a series. I can load as many in as I want, provided I have enough space on the output drive to load in, you know, all these uh, fairly large projects. And I can define what the control is. And now I get some assembly options. Um, and you'll notice that as I'm moving through the wizard, that there's a side panel here. This is interactive too, so I can go back to different spots in the wizard. And look at different areas and re you know change my mind and, and, and go back and change things in the wizard. Um, so the variant detection mode, this particular sample is a cancer sample. So somatic cancer or heterogeneous sample. And with cancer samples in particular, um, depending on the percentage of, of tumor cells that you have, you know, in your tumor sample, and how uh, you know the the how frequent those variations are occurring in the tumor, um, it's going to be highly variable depending on the sample that you have. And so this is one where I might go into the advanced options, and you can see that if you're an existing customer, these have changed quite a bit. We have some new things. Uh, we can do things like remove clonal reads, um, which is off by default, but we can turn it on if your particular um, targeting method is prone to producing clonal reads. If it's not a very complex library and you have a lot of PCR artifact, um, you can certainly turn on, and that will affect some of the, for those kind of samples, will affect um, and should improve the accuracy. Um, so there's a few changes here. Under the variant um, options, there's two sets of filters. There are the editable filters. Those are filters that can be undone downstream and analysis. And then there's the fixed filters, which are really meant to remove sequencing noise from the SNP analysis. Um, so if we, if we report every single sequencing error, we could potentially have millions of false positive SNPs that occur at you know, less than 1%. So with, with cancer data sets, uh, it's, it's a fine line between um, where the noise is and where you can detect the signal. And, that, and, that's, and that's the challenge with, and I, and I won't go through all these in detail, but there are some knobs and adjustments that you can make. Strand bias, some capture preps are more prone to producing uh, biased reads that all go in one direction. In some cases, that's all there is. So if you, have, if you, if you filter against strand bias, you could potentially remove all your, all your variations. So knowing how your sample is prepared, um, you may turn this on, you may turn it off. So it's, it's one filter for uh, somatic detection that may be important. Anyway, so, so however you set the filters, um, we're going to, in this case, go with uh, minimal filtering for a somatic or, or cancer sample. And uh, now there's a little new interface here. If we know the gender, we can assign it. I don't in this case. And we name the project. And pick an output folder, preferably one that has lots of space. And I can go here, and you can see that there's a, it indicates what's going to get saved out. There will be a folder called Cancer Demo, and within that folder, two, two uh, dot .assembly packages, one for cancer, one for normal, so two different sets. Uh, when I run this assembly from the, from the wizard, when it's done, first of all, there will be a log that shows me the progress, you know, so I can see the script is written, and these are the instructions to the assembler. And when I start, I'll get a um, a log that starts up. And when it's done, I'll have options on where to open that dot assembly output. And when it's multiple sample, there will also be a multiple sample erased our project that automatically gets generated and, and populated. Um, I'll show you. We're, we won't let this whole thing assemble, but you can see um, we can watch the progress. I can export the log if there's a problem. I also typically watch my... Um, task manager, and you can see the assembler is called XNG, and right now it's using 94% of my CPUs. And so we're going to stop that, and you can see there that it stopped and it gives me an error, it says it wasn't successful. So again, so this script then is very useful, or this log is very useful for troubleshooting. So we'll, we'll quit Seekman Engine, and I'll show you how to manually, so if I want to compare, in this case it could be normal, in tumor, or it could just be multiple different samples, you know, of exomes or, or anything that's targeted resequencing. To compare those samples to each other, um, I want to bring the projects into ArrayStar. And ArrayStar allows me to start a new project, variant comparison. 
And I just want to show you the startup here. So when I click Next, um, I can add a Seekman engine dot assembly folder. So I can load these in. There's the normal. And again, this can be done automatically if I uh, once the assembly is done. But if I close the wizard and I want to come back later and do this, I can load them in manually. So when I click Next, this is the part that I wanted to show you is that with a human data set, this area that's blue, it says the variant annotation database, it's, it's for human data. And we can import all the annotations from the, the variety of different databases into the project if I check this box. And it checks to see that you have a service plan that's active, and it says yes, now we can access that database and pull the data in. And when I click Next, it'll start to do that. Now that takes, on a project this size, it could very well take 15 minutes or so to pull all the data in and populate um, the, the variant table. So we won't do that right now. But I just wanted to show you that interface. That's where it's actually going to come in into the project. And so I'll go to an ArrayStar project now that's been opened already. And so when I open ArrayStar, I can see, you know, just very simple. I have a normal set, a tumor set. Um, and when I, when I click on a particular experiment, we can see there's some experiment attributes, and it'll give me some assembly information and parameters that were used um, on the right-hand side. But really what I want to look at first is the SNP table. And the SNP table is uh, going to contain all the different variations that, that pass through. And, and the ArrayStar SNP table works, it's, it's a, um, there's a technical term, but I think it's called a two-state table. And so all the data is here, but as I apply filters, I can, you know, make subsets visible. So if I look at the bottom here, I can see that there are 1,169,613 rows, SNPs, in the entire table. By default, we're just showing, um, we can show subsets. So for example, just those SNPs that were um, in Seekman Engine that had those kind of defaults um, those those undoable filters, I can apply that. Now there's you know 38,000 you know SNPs in that um, that had those soft filters applied. And so there's different ways then I can say just show me those selected to use this table. So now I'm just showing um, 1,259 of these SNPs. So however you show by default, there's a lot of SNPs here. We still you know so we need to the challenge with these big data sets is how do I go from a large number of variations to a smaller number that's more manageable? And, and that's really where ArrayStar, the power in ArrayStar comes in. And it's through the filtering. So I can, I can create filters then, and I can filter at either SNP or gene level. Now typically with a, with a variant project, I'm going to filter at the SNP level first, find SNPs that are interesting, and then if I want to say, well, tell me what genes are involved with these SNPs, I can create a gene table as well and do gene level type analysis. That's a pretty common way to use ArrayStar. So if I, if I create a SNP level filter, there's different groups that I can filter on. I can, I can filter on the group, I can filter on annotations, I can filter on ontology, classification, statistics. So there's a, you know, different categories here. I'm just going to stick with sample group and create a filter for both the tumor and, in this case, the normal tissue. And so I'm saying, find SNPs that occur in the normal, and now I'm going to choose the criteria. And we get this dialog that comes up. And the filtering dialog then has multiple tabs. And so you can see there's some, this is quite a bit different from some of the earlier versions of the SNP filter, and we've added quite a few more fields. And this is really to support um, the new information that's coming in from the variant annotation database. Um, but initially, uh, before I filter at all on, on database information, I want to apply a more general filter just to kind of narrow um, the set down to a, a more uh, manageable set. So if I go back to general, one way that I might do this is just say, just show me the non-synonymous SNPs and that are within a targeted area and some statistics. Um, and, and these are the important ones r right here. These, uh, these two are critically important, and they have a huge impact on your downstream analysis. One is the, um, the minimum SNP percentage. So 
I'm looking for variations that are not going to occur in Mendelian ratios. They could be they could be in Mendelian ratios, but they could also be at lower uh, percentages as well. But the challenge is, is I don't know necessarily where the noise level is in this exome, right? It could be one percent, it could be five percent, um, it could be higher than five percent, and so somewhere the signal will lose the signal in the noise. That's kind of an unknown area. And from what I've seen with all different data sets, um, it varies from data set to data set. So these are the two that I like to experiment with the most and look at the results and, and custom filter then for each sample. So I'm going to start with 10% uh, um, to 100% and a minimum depth of 25. And not, these are non-synonymous SNPs. So I say, OK, search. And there's 7,767 SNPs in the normal sample that meet that criteria. And so then I can save these as a set then. Now, I've done this a couple times in this project, so we'll call it normal two. And then we start to keep track of a set list then within this project. And when I select over a, a set, you can see the details panel shows me, you know, I did the same thing before earlier. It tells me what the filters were, in case I forgot what they were. Um, so I get an idea of what each set contains. So now I can go back. There's a filter button over here, and I can apply the same filter to the tumor. And again, it can be, it doesn't have to be cancer. This is just the example I'm using. It can be any exomes that we're comparing, right? And I can create sets then for each one of my projects. And so again, I'll just keep the same filters. I'll just double check here to make sure that we, yeah, we maintain the same filters. And I search. And I can see in the tumor sample, 8,316 SNPs. So we got a few more SNPs there. And again, we save as a set. All right, so once I have sets, now I can start to do the comparison. Um, and so things like Venn diagrams um, become a lot more useful. And so if I do a Venn diagram, the controller is over here on, on the right side. So I could do the normal from early, earlier to the tumor that I just did um, like that. So I can then compare different sets. We, if you have more than two sets, we can go to a, you know, a dartboard kind of diagram. These are overlapping, so you can do up to maybe maybe 10 on a dartboard diagram. Um, so you can find, you know, things like all the SNPs that are in common between all the sets or SNPs in common between different subsets or different groups. So you may expect, you know, uh, different groups to share SNPs if it's some kind of a, um, you know, like a trio analysis of, of some sort. You may have SNPs that you would expect to be shared between parent and offspring. So you can create these Venn diagrams then. And from the Venn diagrams, so I'll go back to the traditional, um, you can get a, you know, look at, just look at the picture and see whether or not I got the filters right. So I would expect in this case that most of the SNPs are common between, you know, in, with the normal and tumor from a single patient. And I would expect there to be, ideally, if it was perfectly clean analysis, only some novel SNPs in the tumor. So I might want to say, well, why, do, why are there some SNPs over here in the normal group um, that aren't in the tu uh, tumor group? And, so that's, and that's the kind of analysis that you can do in the software. So I might say, well, show me that subset. I want to look at those. So I can select that region and say, show me the table of those SNPs. And so then I can go through and evaluate each one of these SNPs that were you know, in the normal but not, not in the tumor. And I see a couple of things. I'm just going to look at this. If you look at the tumor depth column, notice that we did a depth cutoff of 25. So in quite a few cases, there was a SNP in the tumor as well. It just didn't quite meet the depth cutoff. So I might go back in my filter and say, let's reduce that filter to 20, or maybe the depth should be 15 in that range. All right? And so you can see then what the effect of your filtering has then on the result very quickly. And maybe you go back and adjust the filters a little bit. So you can interrogate very easily these different subgroups. Right? So I can figure out, okay, maybe I change my filters. Maybe I don't. Maybe there's, you know, there's going to be a compromise, and I say, I can live with that. I understand why we have some SNPs that are just in the normal. Then I can go back here to the tumor and say, show me a, tab a table of those selected SNPs. 
And if I populate the right columns here, there's a, a, a column manager button. And this is a new interface that's really nice in ArrayStar because there's a lot of different columns. I'm only showing a small subset of information. And so I'm right now I'm showing the percent in the normal in the tumor, the called sequence, and the depth. And you can see that for SNP info, there's things like amino acid changes and genotype. And so all these are different fields of information that I might choose to populate this table with. Here's the depth and SNP percent. And when you um, click over some of these, there's a description. So as I move down, um, here's some uh, from the genome template packages. There's some database information that gets pulled right up, uh, way upstream from SeqMan Engine. So GURP scores and dbSNP and Cosmic IDs. The variant annotation database brings in more fields, and they're broken down into allele frequencies. So here's 1,000 genomes and the exome variant server. Um, these are ethnic-specific um, groups. You know, so if I hover over or click on one of those points, I can, it'll give me a description. You know, this is Sierra Leone samples, major allele frequencies, major and minor. Um, genotype frequencies, functional predictions. So we have all these databases for pot potentially uh, um, SNPs that are um, damaging or disease-causing. Evolutionary uh, conservation scores, all different database information, and pathogenicity. So we have all these different fields that we could populate with um, this table with. What I like to do, though, is first find the right basic filters in terms of depth and percent get a subset, and then pull in some more information into my analysis to narrow down my analysis. And so I'm going to uh, just close this for right now. So I can see here's the subset of SNPs, um, and I can kind of scroll through that are in the tumor, um, but they weren't called in the normal. And again, I can see in some cases, though, there's there are SNPs at the normal, it's just that they aren't, it isn't quite deep enough. And so I may sort my table by the column. And find the subset where there is no SNP at all. There wasn't a call there for the normal, so there wasn't a SNP call there. So there's different ways that I can sort the table and analyze on it. Um, I can also bring in these columns now for, let's bring in something here for functional predictions. I'm just going to select, just like that, add those columns. And you can see for these SNPs, now we're adding these columns to the right. And I can, and depending on the database, and if I hover over cell, I can get all the information for that cell. So I get all the changes. I can get the allele frequencies. I can get the scores from all the different databases. It's all, all available to me. And I can sort then by these different columns. So if I decide, you know, and again, everyone's going to have their own preference, but mutation taster, maybe I'm going to sort here. And I can see that I have the disease-causing SNPs raised to the top. And I can resort these columns, so I might decide that mutation taster, um, I can move that, move that column so it's more central. And now I can look at these particular SNPs. So here's one, uh, I just have to notice the TP53 um, gene, the SNP is occurring there. It's in the tumor sample at 53%. It's not being detected at all in the normal. Um, and if I want to look at the assembly now, so in some of these cases, if I see, well, I've got a SNP in the normal and in the tumor, but it's really light in the normal, maybe I want to look at the actual assembled data to see what's going on and to verify. But I can right-click here and send this selection to SeqMan Pro. So I'm going to say, show me the tumor assembly right at that point. So to launch SeqMan Pro, that specific chromosome, which is chromosome 17, and it'll go right to that point in the assembly. And now on your on the release build that you try out, it'll automatically launch. I've got a, a development build here, so I have to pre-launch it. So, so I can look at the, um, this is the tumor sample. I can see the alignment now in SeqMan Pro, which is really powerful. Twisty triangle shows me uh, the annotation. I can see, okay, that looks like a SNP here. 
I got lots of A's here. It looks like a pretty strong G to A. But what's really useful is to be able to compare that to the normal right in one view. So it's going to take now the same region from a, a different assembly and pull that into the same view. And so I can look at them side by side. And it's especially useful when there's a question. You know, if you have a low SNP, something that's detected a little bit in the normal, I might want to look at that. So when I look in the normal, I don't see any kind of variations there. So you can then set your view up where you can look at both side by side from multiple different samples. So it's a tremendously useful way to verify your answer. You know, if you're finding differences between different samples, I can keep doing this exact same process, you know, and check out. So here's one where we've got um, a little bit of SNP in the normal, but we have 17% in the tumor. So I might want to look at that. And now this is going to be a different chromosome altogether, but I can still load that into the SeekMan project. And so it'll go and load chromosome 11. And again, I can look at that. And this is one, and, and here's kind of an interesting uh, example. So when I look at this alignment, I see a string of Cs in a row. And of course, as many of you know, homopolymers, where you have strings of bases, can oftentimes um, be a little bit less accurate. So I might look at this and say, well, we're going to have a 2% SNP in the normal, but it's probably a homopolymeric artifact. Maybe I go back and add the home, there, there are filters upstream that can reduce SNP calls in homopolymers, right? So again, I can interpret my result and say that's probably just noise. Maybe I need to go and look at the tumor sample and see if it, does it look like it has the same kind of noise there, or do I believe that that is actually a SNP? So again, the power of the software is, again, an array star you take huge SNP tables, um, apply some reasonable filters, evaluate the result in the Venn diagram, look at them in SeekMan Pro, apply different filters if you think that's necessary, uh, and then bring in um, the database information to try to find you know, variants that are, in this case, likely disease-causing or deleterious to the proteins. Um, now there's another level then that we can do the analysis. So this is, again, SNP level analysis. There's still 1,200 SNPs here. Maybe I apply a filter on, you know, if, I'm, if I use mutation taster, maybe I go back to the filters and apply that same filter and say, and I might say, only show me those that are disease-causing, automatic or disease-causing D, and I forget the exact difference there. Let's see. So I could have both add them to the filter set, and say OK, and then search. And now I get a, I'll get a much smaller subset, 549 SNPs that meet that criteria. So I can then, um, when I import that data, I can filter against that data and get further narrow down this set. So, And that's really how ArrayStar is used. It's, it it's, um, displays huge amounts of data, gives you all different filtering options to find those subsets of interest. Now I can cross over from SNP to gene level analysis as well. So if I go back to my Venn diagram, and my tumor SNPs, I can select that region and say, show the table of genes that contain these SNPs. So if I click that quick link, um, now I have a gene table. And the gene table then, I can populate that. I'm going to remove those columns to the right. And I can now use the same kind of a column manager to pull in um, gene annotations. Now the gene annotations, um, come in different ways. So they may come in with the reference sequences. I can also do a, I should show you this first here, a file import annotations. And in this case, uh, let's see if I have it on here. It is uh, a gene annotation file from dbNSFP, which contains all different, similar to the SNP annotations, but it's a gene level, much smaller database. Um, so it's, you can see it's only 37 me uh, megabytes. And so I can import this into ArrayStar. It's already been done, so I won't, I won't do that. But oh, I guess I can cancel it. I accidentally said go, but we'll cancel that. 
Okay, so I import those annotations. Now when I go to my column manager, I have all these uh, gene values, but also these, this gene information. So I could bring in things like gene description, and I haven't looked at all of these, so I don't know. Um, I think those three are pretty informative, so I can import those in. And it's kind of a, a you know, essentially a, a kind of a sanity check to see, you know, I expect to have some um, cancer causing, some, some effects in cancer genes here. I can sort by descriptions and show uh, only the selected genes in this case. And so if I look at disease, disease description, I can see, you know, multiple cases of uh, some of the different um, cancers. Let me just sort here and find one that's, and again, depending on how aggressively you filter, there's going to be, um, you know, a, a could be a very small gene list with just a handful of genes or, or a big gene list like this with many different genes in it. And so I can see here's a, one of the genes that I think is in the data set here that's pretty commonly shows up, and TP53 I know is down here as well. So I'd probably go back and apply a couple more filters. Um, and again, um, so I can see a number of cancer genes here that are that are popping up in the analysis. So again, so just as a, as a quick recap, I'm going to jump out of the software here and go back into the PowerPoint. So the software, um, in terms of how you can implement it, uh, it is available as desktop software. A network where you can share it on multiple computers or you know institute wide where your whole institute can purchase uh, licenses that you have access from any point um, it runs on cloud workstations uh, we can you know again use Amazon to, to assemble and store the data and technical support um, 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. central uh, uh, daylight time now uh, and there's multiple different training resources. So we'll do more webinars like we did today on specific topics. There's many different videos. There's some new videos on these new workflows. And there's tutorial manuals, uh, again, on our, under our support section on our website. And if you do have more questions, I will stick around here and answer some more if Katie has some. And otherwise, you can contact me at any time. Here's my email address. Uh, feel free to send me an email with additional questions that you have. And with that, I'll, I'd like to thank you again for joining me today, and I'll take any questions that have come up. Thank you, Matt. Uh, we do have um, just a couple of questions, um, but we have uh, a few minutes here, so um, if anyone has additional questions, you can continue to chat those in. Um, so the first question is, um, are there any limitations on uh, the number of samples you can assemble or um, analyze in the software? Um, I, there's not really a limit to the number that you can assemble. So you can set up, you know, as much, it really comes down to your hardware, how much space you have to save the output files. The data will stream in, assemble, and get saved out, and, and so it can be scaled up to, you know, hundreds of exomes. Um, the analysis in ArraySTAR, uh, you know, we've tested it up to you know, about 100 human exomes worth of data at a time. Um, depending on how things are filtered, if, if it's completely unfiltered, the capacity would be a little bit lower. If you do some more pre-filtering on those really big data sets, uh, then, then the capacity is higher. But it's definitely over 100 human exomes in ArraySTAR. Great, thank you. And then um, the other question we had come in, uh, when you showed the filtering, you were using the variant annotation database for human data. Uh, what options are there for uh, SNP filtering and annotation um, if you're working with a non-human data set? So, so that sort of information is often contained in VCF files. And so VCF files are used two ways. One, just to kind of record interesting positions, base pair positions. But some VCF, VCF files also contain annotation information. And so ArraySTAR can import VCF files as essentially annotation files. So if you have a non-model organism and uh, has annotations, you can oftentimes get that in VCF format and import that into your SNP table. The other way is that uh, you can, kind of like what I showed today, is filter on SNPs, find an interesting subset of SNPs, and then create a gene table from that SNP list. 
and you can import gene level annotations, which are probably more common for non-model organisms. And then you can, uh, you know, use those annotations in the gene table to help with your analysis. Great, thank you. Uh, that, that's all the questions we have right now. Um, but as Matt said, if you have additional questions later, um, feel free to email him directly. He's our um, NGS and genomics um, expert here at DNA Star. A couple of additional items. If you go to www.dnastar.com, you'll notice we have um, a link right here on our homepage to the webinars page. And if you missed any part of today's webinar, there'll be a recording here um, right on this page. Uh, we'll also email everyone a link to that recording. So um, if you want to go back and view any part of today's session again, you're welcome to. And then in a couple of weeks, I'll be giving a webinar um, showing some of our molecular biology tools, um, specifically some of our new workflows for multiple genome alignment and annotation. And finally, Matt also mentioned throughout the presentation we have some shorter um, videos showing specific parts of different workflows uh, for next-gen assembly, SNP analysis. Um, so if you click on the video link um, from any page, you'll get to the list of um, our videos uh, sorted by topic. So that's another great resource if you want to uh, get some more information about any, any particular workflow.